In the book of Leviticus, uh, Leviticus chapters 24 to 26, to be more specific, we, uh, we read about a, an amazing system of economics that God imposed on his people, uh, the Jews. The, um, the system was referred to as the sabbatical year ordinances, which culminated in the year of Jubilee. Of course, we today are not under this system, but I do believe that there are some valuable lessons and insights that continue to inform our decisions and our conduct today that come from this particular uh, system. First of all, we need to understand that the term sabbatical year and jubilee refer to different things. However, they are part of a similar whole. Let's take uh, sabbatical year, that term, and read about that in Leviticus chapter 25. We read, the Lord then spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I am going to give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field and for six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather in its produce. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. You shall not reap your harvests after growth and you shall not gather your grapes of untrimmed vines. The land shall have a sabbatical year. All of you shall have the Sabbath produced uh, produce of the land as food for yourself, for your male and female slaves and your hired workers and your foreign residents, those who live as strangers among you. Even your cattle and the animals that are in your land shall have all its produce to eat. So uh, God commanded his people to give their land a rest. Now I know there are a lot of uh, uh, reasons for that, scientific reasons for that, that people have come up with today. But in that time, it was simply a command that was coming from God every seventh year. And they were to live off of what they produced on the sixth year. And so when the people questioned, well, how would they survive? I mean, it'd be two years before they, they could harvest again if they were to follow this. God answered that every sixth year, he would provide three years worth of food. And we read about that in uh, verses 20 and 22. It says, but if you say, what are we going to eat in the seventh year if we do not sow nor gather in our produce? Then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the produce for three years. When you are sowing the eighth year, you can still eat old things from the produce, eating the old until the ninth year when its produce uh, comes in. So that's the, uh, the sabbatical. Then we read about a Jubilee and that's in chapter 25, beginning in verse eight. It says, you are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbath of years, that is 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall sound a horn all through your land. So you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you and each of you shall return to his own property and each of you shall return uh, to his family. If you shall have the 50th year as a jubilee, you shall not sow nor harvest its aftergrowth nor gather grapes from its untrimmed vines for it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. So this command was followed by the instruction concerning uh, the Jubilee, which we just read here. 
The term jubilee meant horn of a ram, which was used as a trumpet, so that eventually the word simply referred to a trumpet. The point was that after seven cycles of these sabbatical years, on the 10th day of the seventh month, which was the Day of Atonement, the trumpets would sound throughout the land announcing the year of Jubilee. Now the book of Leviticus gives details concerning what was supposed to happen during the 50th year. For example, all the property sold was to revert back to the original owners and families as designated by God at the time of Exodus. At the time of Exodus, God divided the land among the tribes and families and so on and so forth. The idea was if you sold a piece of land or rented out a piece of land during this time, uh, at the year of Jubilee, that land would revert back to its original, uh, original owners. Um, all slaves, for example, were to be freed or to be purchased back on the year of Jubilee. All debts were forgiven uh, and considered paid in full uh, on the year of Jubilee. Once again, the land would rest and there would be no planting or harvesting. They had to live off of the previous year's crops and it would be a time of feasting and celebration. So this system of Sabbaths and Jubilees uh, imposed a, a very unusual economic system on the Jews. Uh, however, it did provide a lot of benefits for them as well. For example, it prevented greed and empire building. I mean, there was a definite limit to what you could own and how long you could keep it. If so-and-so sold you a large portion of his uh, heritage land, uh, even a very fruitful portion of it, and that gave you your land plus this land that you bought from that person, you had a lot of land, you could produce a lot of you know, harvest and so on and so forth. You might be the big shot you know, in the area, the, the big guy with the big barns because you had a lot of land. But on the year of Jubilee, that land that you bought had to revert back to the original, uh, to the original owner. So in this way, it prevented greed, as I say, and empire building. Uh, there was a definite limit to what you could own and how long that you could own it. You could uh, grow in wealth and power, but it was limited in time and amount, and eventually you had to give it back. Uh, and this, of course, prevented long-term oppression by those who were wealthy against those who were poor. Another uh, benefit of this system, it prevented generational slavery. Uh, if someone, and Marty's talked about this uh, several times, uh, if someone uh, had a bad harvest, for example, and too many debts, and was forced to sell himself and his family into slavery in order to make ends meet, here's your choice, you starve to death, uh, or you sell yourself into slavery, into service uh, to someone else and you work for him and you don't starve to death. You get to live somewhere, you get to eat, okay? Well, uh, there was a time limit for this kind of, uh, for this kind of service. Uh, in this way, there was hope, uh, even in the worst of circumstances, that your land and your freedom would be fully returned to you. So even if you lost your land because of a poor harvest or for whatever reason, there was hope in the future that you would regain it. If you had to sell yourself into slavery and into service, there was hope that one day you would regain your, your freedom. Uh, another uh, benefit, it also provided economic guideline and stability uh, to the people. Uh, the value of land and the value of slaves was fixed according to the proximity of the Jubilee. Uh, if you were 30 years away from Jubilee, then the land that you had was uh, you know, pretty valuable because you had 30 years to work it before you had to give it back. 
And of course, if you were only two years away from Jubilee and you purchased a piece of land from someone else, well then that land was not as valuable because you only had two years to work it uh, and to harvest it before you had to give it back on the year of Jubilee. And so it provided sort of guidelines for the buying and the selling of land and so on and so forth. And of course, one more, it guaranteed harmony and peace. Uh, the system gave a certain stability to that society. Prices were fixed. Uh, the people had hope for the future, even if they had some setbacks. And each family had a guarantee uh, that their home would be once again their home, even if they hit a rough patch or a time of, of difficulty. And so for the Jews, living within this system, the year of Jubilee was long anticipated and beneficial. It was also very meaningful, even beyond what it represented economically and socially. For example, the year of Jubilee represented God's mercy. I mean, only someone with a, with a mind of mercy could come up with a system like this. The fact that debts were forgiven, not just paid back, but they were literally wiped out. The fact that land was returned to the original owners and their families. The fact that slaves were freed and that people had enough food to live on even though they didn't plant or harvest for a full year. And so through the year of Jubilee, God showed in a very concrete way uh, that he truly uh, loved and cared for the earthly welfare of his people. Um, you know, God owns everything. He's not worried about anything. But human beings, on the other hand, we worry about stuff. We worry about our land. We worry uh, about the fact that we'll have enough food to eat. Well, in this system, God was seeing to those uh, not only physical, but very real emotional needs uh, that people had for a stability uh, of life. Uh, another uh, another uh, thing that uh, Jubilee uh, represented was God's sovereignty. You know, the point of giving back the land to the original owner who had been originally appointed by God was to remind everyone that the land belonged to God. It was his land. It wasn't, it wasn't the people's land, it was his land. And the idea of Jubilee was a reminder to everyone that the land belonged to God and the people were simply stewards of that land. Um, that no crop was planted or harvested uh, was, uh, you know, during the year of Jubilee, was to remind them that God was the Lord of the harvest and he provided the harvest, not the earth. And if he wanted to provide three years worth of harvest in a single year, well then that's what he would do. Uh, that slaves were freed, reminded them that everyone was a servant of God and, and everyone was accountable for God or to God rather in how they treated uh, other people. And so Jubilee reminded the Jews that God owned everything by virtue of his creation of everything. And men uh, and women were merely stewards and managers of what God owned. And they were merely stewards and managers for a time, especially this system of uh, Jubilee uh, really brought home this idea that you only own something just for a time. And then of course, the system also represented God's demands. God required that his people show justice and mercy. And Jubilee was the opportunity to do so in a dynamic way. You, you couldn't take advantage of a fellow Jew by enslaving him forever or, or leaving him homeless. One day you had to restore these people. And so Jubilee motivated the people to treat each other in a just and merciful way or answer to the Lord uh, in punishment. And so it served justice and mercy uh, into the very fabric of the social customs and the laws of the people at that time. A very, very unique 
uh, economic system. Well, one of the interesting features of the Old Testament study, or of this one anyways, is that within its pages, you find many previews of what is to come in the future. For example, Noah's Ark that carried eight souls to safety through the flood is a preview of the church, uh, which will carry saved souls through the judgment. Uh, the children of Israel, for example, walking through the parted waters of the Red Sea to safety is a preview of believers who come through the waters of baptism to be safe uh, from the second death. And so we have many such previews in the Old Testament about things that are taking place in the new. Uh, many such previews given through people and prophecies and events. And so the year of Jubilee is also a preview of the future, but it is a preview not of an event in the future, but rather a person in the future. For those of us who live over 3000 years after the year of Jubilee was begun, Jesus Christ is our Jubilee. The Jubilee in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ as the jubilee of those who believe in the Savior. And here's why. First of all, Jesus Christ is our Savior. Not all of the Jews were slaves and not all had forfeited their homes and required repatriation uh, on the year of Jubilee. But we, in the present age, all of us have been enslaved to sin and all of us await uh, our condemnation. Romans chapter three, verse 23. And all of us have lost our heavenly home with God. And all of us have been separated from our spiritual family. And we owe a debt that we can never hope to repay. And so when Jesus came and died on the cross and then resurrected from the dead, he freed us from the slavery uh, uh, that we had to sin and death by offering us forgiveness and the power to overcome sin through the Holy Spirit. He, he paid for our debt of sin so that uh, we uh, are no longer condemned by God uh, for sin. He joined us to the family of God, which is his church. And he gave us back our heavenly home with God. And so Jesus embodies and extends God's fullest expression of mercy and justice for all who believe in him. And so we can say that Jesus is the fulfillment of the mercy that was previewed by the Jubilee many, many years ago. In another way, uh, uh, Jubilee is a preview of Jesus. And that is that Jesus is our Lord. Nothing new here. I'm not telling you something that you didn't know. I'm simply trying to connect the idea of Jubilee uh, with the concept of Jesus. And so he is our Lord. Paul the Apostle says that all that has been created has been created for and through Jesus Christ. Colossians uh, chapter one, verses 16 to 18. A jubilee was instituted to remind the Jews that the land and what it produced the nation and its people and riches, all of this belong to God in the first place. Well, God has revealed to us in his word that not only the land and the people belong to God, but that everything in the material and spiritual world was actually created by Jesus and for his personal use. In this way, the Godhead points man to Christ not only as the merciful savior, but as the sovereign Lord previewed in Jubilee as well. And then of course, Jesus is our judge. Through Jubilee, God required his people to act a certain way towards one another and strangers as well. Through Jesus Christ, God continues to demand that we love one another, John 13, 35 and that we forgive one another. In Matthew chapter six, verse 12, and we, we heard about that in this morning's sermon. 
Uh, for the Jews, this was a requirement that was enforced by law every 50 years. You have to love your brother, you know, and you, you show that by giving back the land, by freeing the slave, and, uh, by, by, uh, by wiping away the debts. This was enforced upon you through law every 50 years, all right? For us, the demand to love and forgive is part of our daily requirements as Christians. The difference is that through Christ, that law is written on our hearts, so to speak. And we are enabled to do it each day by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Like the Jews, however, uh, we will be judged for failing to keep the requirements of love and forgiveness by the Lord of Jubilees, who is uh, Jesus Christ. Isn't it, a, isn't it a wonderful thing? I mean, as, as unusual as this is, uh, forgive me here. As unusual as this is, this, this system here, what was, it, what was it doing? It was merely legislating love. It was merely enforcing love between you know, brothers you know, in, in a national family and it was doing it uh, through law. You know, we have the 10 commandments. There's the, the, only, the, only com the only commandment to love, you know, is the commandment to love God. There isn't any other commandment that says you, you have to love so-and-so, you know, proactively love so-and-so. Most of the commandments are, you know, not to do harm as a form of love. But this system here was a, 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 a legal way, if you wish, uh, to force people to demonstrate their love uh, one to another. And, and the people made the effort to do this. Think about what a different uh, reality we have as people of faith. They were people of faith. What a different reality we have as a people of faith. Uh, the law to love one another isn't something that comes around every 50 years, it's, it's, it's printed on our hearts. It's an impulse that we have as Christians. We have the impulse to do it whenever we see an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to do it. And we've been given the Holy Spirit that enables us to love uh, one another. Uh, where do you think that impulse comes from? I know it's a lot of fun, you know, to use new gear, new, new chainsaws, new hacksaws, new stuff, uh, the camaraderie of, of going, you know, and seeing a yard that's a, just a total mess, you know, trees dangling and smashed and broken. And, you know, there's a certain newness to it, you know. But after six hours of backbreaking work, and I'm not saying I'm one that has done it, but I've spoken to some of the guys who do it, they're happy to do it, but after a while, it's a job. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's not fun anymore. It's a job. It hurts. It's dangerous because uh, I've spoken to a couple of brothers who have uh, hurt themselves you know, uh, doing, doing this work. Why do we do it? Because there's a law? Because we're close to some kind of jubilee year that enforces us to do this thing? What moves us to give up a Sunday and a Saturday to go do backbreaking work? What moves some of the ladies to come in and, and, and to put together food and make dozens of lunches? What moves people to lend out their, uh, their equipment and their tools? What moves them to do that? Well, the Spirit of God living within us is what moves us to do those kinds of things. And I mention this only to highlight the idea of what a difference between the age of the law and the age of grace that we live in, between the, the age of rules and the age of the spirit that, that we live in. And so the year of Jubilee was an important moment in the Jewish life because regardless of their condition, the people could look forward to this time with hope. The hope was that all would be forgiven. The hope was that 
all would be made right. The hope was that they could go home again and start over. Imagine if you had to give up your land for 15 years because you went broke and you had to go live somewhere else and someone else was using your land, someone else was living in your house, someone else was using your cattle and so on and so forth. And you, weren't you, wouldn't you be counting down the days, 12 years to go, nine years to go, three years to go until a Jubilee? Uh, this was the, a very rare occasion of when the law was giving hope because normally the law simply brought death. And so through the law adjudicated through the Jubilee, it gave hope to the people for forgiveness and restoration and new beginnings between one another. But think about it for a second. This time came for them every 50 years. Not every five months, not every quote Christmas. Oh, why wow, I can't wait till Christmas. You know every 50 years and they agonized in their slavery or in their poverty until that day finally arrived. We on the other hand, we have our jubilee before each and every day. I should say before us each and every day because the Bible says now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. You could also say, now is the day of Jubilee. We, we have it before us every single day. Today, all of our sins and errors can be washed away in the blood of Christ. As uh, Peter says, now why, or Paul says, now why do you delay, get up, excuse me, as Ananias says, now why do you delay, get up and be baptized and wash away your sins by calling on his name. The key word there, we know all about baptism is the word delay. Why do you delay? Why are you waiting? Why, what are you waiting for? Today is the day of freedom. They had to wait 49 years, 34 years, you know. For us, today is the day of freedom. If any of us tonight are trapped in some kind of sin, well then today is the day of freedom. We don't have to wait 41 years in order to be freed from sin. We can be freed from sin today. And of course, in the same way, today we can be free from the condemnation of death. Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is there now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. No, no reason to agonize over God being angry with us. No reason to agonize over the idea of what will happen to me in judgment? Uh, how will God uh, judge all the bad things that, I have, that I've done in my life? Today, we can be free from the condemnation of, uh, uh, of our sins and of course, Today, we can obtain our heavenly home and, and, and all the blessings of God for an eternity. In Luke, it says, and he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Notice all the passages I read was, it was all today, now, why do you wait? Our jubilee is every single day, uh, is our jubilee. Everything that they waited for for 50 years, we have before us every single day, if we reach out and take advantage of us. So this could be your day of Jubilee, if you come to Christ, who is the only Jubilee that God offers. The Jubilee in the Old Testament only prepared our minds and hearts for the true Jubilee of the New Testament. Come to Jesus by confessing your faith and repenting of your sins and being immersed in waters in order to receive the jubilee that he offers uh, to you. Or come to Jesus confessing your sins and receive the prayers and the restoration uh, so that you can enjoy once again your jubilee in Christ, so that you can once again be at home with Christ. And then one last point about a jubilee that 
we, we don't always think of. When the Jews died in between Jubilee years, they remained in the state of poverty or slavery that they were in at that time. If you died in between Jubilee, uh, the person that you had sold your land to didn't give the land back to your family on that day. You died in the state that you were, that you were in. Don't remain without Christ while you are alive because after you die, there will be no offer to pay for your debts. There will be no offer to free you from slavery. You will remain that way forever. And so the encouragement is always, don't miss your jubilee. Come to Christ today. Why, because the preacher says so? No, because today is the day of jubilee. And it is so because the gospel is being preached here tonight. And so if you need to take advantage of the wonderful jubilee that Christ offers to all, then I do encourage you to come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. 